Hey guys, welcome back to Philosophy for Flourishing, the show where we explore principles and practices for living the best, most fulfilled life possible. Today on the show, I have Gary Hoover. He's an entrepreneur, and he's also the founder of AmericanBusinessHistory.org, very interesting website with lots of information about what has made some of America's greatest businesses great. And he's got lots of insights into living a good life, running good businesses, and the intersection between those two things. So I hope you enjoy the show. Here it comes. So much for postponing a day for me. Um, sure. Long editing meeting yesterday. Well, it's good to be busy. It is. Busy. Busyness. Business. That's what I want to talk to you about today. <laughs> Great. And uh, you're joining me from Texas, right? Yes, Flatonia, Texas, which is about an hour southeast of Austin. I lived in Austin uh, 35 years and moved out here almost five years ago. But you're originally from Indiana, and the yes. town you grew up in, I think, plays a, a large role in your story. Could you talk uh, a little bit about that and, and General Motors? Oh, for sure. <laughs> and in fact, uh, uh, we just published a, uh, an article, a biographical article on Alfred P. Sloan, the guy that built General Motors, the most important single executive. And uh, I made the case the greatest businessman in American history. And that was published by the Archbridge Institute uh, last week. And just today we put it on our American business history site. So yeah, uh, Anderson, Indiana, a town of about 60,000 people. 27,000 worked at General Motors, so even more people commuted up from Indianapolis about 45 minutes away to Anderson to work than the other direction. Of course, Indianapolis is much larger. Uh, today, there are zero General Motors employees, 7 million square feet of empty factory buildings, many of which have been demolished, but General Motors donated them to the city. So I saw the full arc of it, but I, you know, I'm growing up there and getting a great education in the uh, Anderson school system and learning about uh, leaders of all type of management styles, about uh, kings and queens and generals and colonels and presidents and governors and how they led, how they made decisions or strategies. And I thought it was all real cool, but I said, well, what about General Motors? They seem to be <laughs> elephant in the room or whatever you want to call it. And the teachers, you know, couldn't answer my questions. I mean, they and all of us students, we all knew what a new Chevy looked like and whether the factory was hiring or not. And running three shifts, which they did most of the years I was growing up. So, you know, running around the clock and making all the electrical parts for General Motors, Delco, Remy and Guide Lamp were the two big operations. And uh, I don't know, 30 factory buildings, plus probably another 30 to 50 manufacturing companies there that supplied them. Plus every barber, every grocer, every banker, everybody in town, you know, it depended upon General Motors employees and the company's business. So it was life itself. Nobody can answer my questions. I'm in a newsstand with my uh, family. My sister's looking at the horse and dog magazines. My big brother's looking at the car and airplane magazines. And I discover Fortune, the great American business magazine. And every uh, spring or summer, they publish a list of the 500 biggest companies in America, the Fortune 500, which we talk a lot about and show some of the old lists and, and things on our AmericanBusinessHistory.org website. And uh, General Motors was the biggest company in the world, the most profitable company in the world, the best run company in the world. And top of that list, and I saw that list, and wow, these people, these writers are asking and sometimes answering the same questions I'm asking. And this is wonderful. Went running right my parents said, you got to get me a subscription to this magazine. They're like, oh, you weird kid. You know, why don't you go play <laughs> basketball like a normal Indiana kid? Anyway, I got my subscription and two months later, I entered the seventh grade. So I started subscribing to Fortune when I was 12. Um, I've read it for 58 years. When the new Fortune 500 comes out every year, I immediately study it. I've gone back and acquired virtually every Fortune back to its beginning, February of 1930. They're a wealth of information. And the whole thing got me interested in how do companies, organizations, how are they founded? How are they born? How do they succeed? How do they fail? What role do the people, the leaders play and everybody else in the organization and competition? And I just fell in love with it. I, I can still remember almost every Fortune article from the 60s that I read as a high school kid. I, I knew what day it was due to arrive. If it didn't come on time, I was all freaked out. And then <laughs> oh, it would arrive and I'd run to my bedroom and open it up and read it cover to cover every issue. So it really shaped uh, uh, my interest. I went on to a life of uh, studying economics at the University of Chicago and uh, working on Wall Street, learning retailing, my real love. 
uh, spending most of my life there than teaching. But throughout that, it's been a fascination and a, and a study of the history of the who are the greats. And biz, the business world does not study our own history. You know, doctors study the Hippocratic Oath. All lawyers do is study history and precedents and everything, or, you know, big chunk of what they do. Most business people never heard of Alfred Sloan, the, the greatest one who ever lived. Most people don't know anything about Julius Rosenwald, the wonderful man that owned Sears Roebuck in its glory days. Um, uh, most of these people I write about are not, not known. Sometimes I do a famous one. I did a biographical piece for Archbridge on uh, Walt Disney. Uh, Walter Chrysler, whose name is known, but the man who was totally unknown. And um, so, yeah, yeah, my, uh, I've kind of come full circle to where now I'm writing uh, about General Motors history, the same thing that got me excited uh, 58 years ago when I was 12. That's fantastic. A lot of people don't study history, I think, because they don't see the use value of it. Mm -hmm. But you are an example of the use value of studying the history of business, because not only did you and do you study the history of business, you've put that knowledge to very good use. You went on to found your own bookstore chain, from what I read. And you're yeah, able yeah. to uh, sell that to Barnes and Noble for a nice chunk of change. What did you learn from launching your own first business? Well, uh, you know, it, uh, a long story there. So my buddies and I started three different businesses in college hmm. and dabbled in it. Uh, I actually in high school put together projects. We had a mock presidential election and I dreamed it up, organized it in, in high school. And I realized wow, if you have an idea that's something new and different, nobody's done it or nobody's done it here, and you get talk to right people into believing in it, you know, like your uh, uh, teachers or the counselors or whatever, sponsors, you can do cool stuff. And I'm like, wow, this is pretty neat. And then I'm in college and uh, we want to go visit a friend. None of us had cars. We, one of the friends lived out on Long Island outside New York City said, why don't y'all come and stay at my place for Thanksgiving? Well, how are we going to get there? And I, I love transportation, always have. And my dad was a traveling salesman and helped plan his trips and everything. So I said, well, you know, you can charter a bus. And we chartered a bus, but then, okay, there's like 10 of us, but it's got 40 seats. So we sold seats to everybody else on campus that needed to go home to New York City. University of Chicago had a lot of students from New York City. And then next thing I know, we're, you know, we're running buses to Philadelphia, to Boston, to Miami, to Denver. You know, we have our own company. <laughs> and, and you just realize, wow, you can do cool things. And it isn't that hard, you know, and fun. And we had a snack bar. We had a book sales thing. So I had, when I was a kid, I really wanted someday run one of the big department stores like Macy's or Marshall Fields. That was their glory days. They were amazing. They had big book departments, big toy departments, all this stuff that's now long gone from Macy's and those guys. But, um, but then over time, I realized in retailing, really the advantage is with the, the smaller competitor. You, you can be closer to your customer. You can look them in the eye. And, uh, and, and I realized that retailing always has such tremendous opportunities, much like the lodging and the restaurant and, and a lot of other industries. And it's lightly regulated. Because I love the bus business, but at that time, we still had the Interstate Commerce Commission telling you what you could do and how much you could charge. And so I had no interest in doing that for a living. Now, you know, Jimmy Carter did away with it. He and Khan did away with the ICC. And so now I would probably enjoy the industry. But retailing, you, you really aren't regulated. You know, get your sales tax permit, lease a space, convince the vendors to sell you inventory, and you're in business. And while laws and regulations do affect you, and more in some states like California than in a state like Texas or Florida, you're still, compared to running an airline or running a bank, you're, you're unregulated. Um, and uh, uh, so I, I gradually came to realize, no, I'd rather start my own retail chain. There are so many opportunities, so many things the big companies are missing. I wrote papers to my bosses at big department store companies because I worked in them for like seven years, I guess, two different giant ones. And, you know, about the future of retailing, nobody really listened. When I came up with the idea of this giant book superstore, which was to take the Toys R Us model of a big selection and low prices in a specialty category, it was before Home Depot came along and Best Buy and Staples and all that, um, take that and apply it to books. So most great ideas are just combining two things that already exist that nobody has combined before or thought of them together because we had bookstores. The giants were called B. Dalton and Walden Books, big national chains and all the malls. And we had superstores, what I call them, the Toys R Us. 
but to say, hey, take the Toys R Us idea. And nobody else came up with that. Uh, I recently did a post, you can find it on the American Business History site, how to be a visionary, something like that. But it surprised me. I found a memo I wrote 14 years before Amazon to my bosses at the big department store company, a memo I wrote that predicted Amazon. You know, I was wow. kind of surprised to come across that and looking through my vast library. You know, I live with like 60,000 books. Kind of. Out <laughs> I of wanted control. to ask you about your library. Yeah. 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 So anyway, uh, but it, but it evolved and I love books, a uh, complete uh, analytical process, very much like Mr. Sloan that built General Motors, not near his caliber or anything, but you know, I picked what city was, I picked what category I should sell, which was books. I picked what city I should start it in, which was Austin which was then about a third as big as it is today, the metropolitan area and population, it beat out Ann Arbor, Madison, Wisconsin, and the Research Triangle were the competitors because oh, of like the, the demand triangle. for books, the cost of opening a store. So it was all very mm-hmm. analytical, very data oriented, which I have always been. And uh, average bookstore did maybe 400,000 a year in volume. We had to do a million to break even, bigger selection, low prices, bigger store building. We did 1.8 million the first year. Within a few years, we were doing uh, 3 million a store and we stretched from Miami to San Diego. Uh, venture capitalists were involved, fired me, sold it to ben- Barnes and Noble. If, if I had owned the whole company, I would probably still own it because I really oh, wow. love the bookstore business. Would have been quite challenging the, uh, in Amazon's early days, but today the bookstores are coming back and doing better. But, um, but, but like any, you don't go into retailing if you don't love competition. If you don't love the joy of winning and are willing to live with the, the, the you know, uh, defeat at times. And I, I love the competitive. I love one thing I see, too. I deal with all these high tech entrepreneurs and give it advice. And there's all this like bitterness about their competitors. Uh, you know, Microsoft, oh, they're all idiots over at Apple and vice versa. And man, in retailing, any good retailer respects other good retailers. You know, there are people out there who hate Walmart. I can assure you no great retailer hates Walmart. Even the Neiman Marcus people or the Saks Fifth Avenue people. And likewise, Sam Walton could have walked into a Saks and said, wow, this, these people are good operators. They run a good store because it doesn't matter whether it's a high-end store, low-end store, Goodwill, Dollar General, Tiffany's, you know, a, a great store is a great store. And a real retailer can recognize that. One that understands its customers, focuses on them and, and connects, you know. Uh, Whole Foods, I was on their board for several years, and I could tell even with two or three stores, they really got it. They were really great merchants, great retailers, and understood their customers, and evolved with their customers from being like a hippie, pure health food store to being a gourmet food store, you know? I mean, they so many things they make money on day, they didn't even carry in their early stores. Um, So they evolved with their customers and where the opportunities were without losing their heart and soul. You know, the leadership are still a bunch of vegans and all that, a bunch of health food nuts, just as they were when I met them and they had one store. So there you, uh, well, I I love how you said that you can do fun things and it's not that hard. Um, You also mentioned, though, some of the regulations, the ICC, Mm -hmm. and perhaps the world is a bit different today. Do you look around and see less opportunities than you did when you were growing up? No, no, I see more. I mean, one thing, and, and when I say it's not hard, that, that's certainly an over... I mean, there are lots of things about it that are incredibly hard. Uh, I, I think a lot of CEOs of big companies that are paid millions deserve every penny they get because a lot of them really don't have a life outside of that. I mean, the pressures, you've got the workers, the unions, you got to how to react to the, uh, you know, dealing with China. And now I got to testify in front of Congress, you know. Uh, so it isn't easy. No, it it is certainly easier in the sense that there are more lawyers and more accountants who understand startups. When I started mine, I lived in St. Louis before I moved to Austin, started a very corporate city at that point, Monsanto, the made department stores company where I work, Ralston Purina, big corporate thing. I go to parties, say I'm going to quit my job at a big company. I was one of the youngest vice presidents in the company and all this. And I quit my job at 30 and go start a company. And man, the people at parties would be kind of look at me like I was weird and kind of drift away. Whereas today, <laughs> hey, in Austin, Texas, oh, he started nine companies. Oh, yeah, that draws a crowd. You know, it's the opposite. So it, it's just the access of data. So much of what I did was based on data from cen- the Census Bureau. I used to have to go down to the get, buy books or order them or go to a government printing office or Xerox at a library. Now it's all two clicks away much better organized there. And, you know, 
Austin was not an entrepreneurial city. I started Bookstop the year before Michael Dell started Dell. There were no account, the big accounting firms didn't even have offices there. When we advertised to get a chief financial officer, I only advertised in Dallas and Houston. There was no talent like that in Austin. It was a university and state capital town, which is what made it a great town to sell books in and a high education level and all that. But, and now there have got to be 40 or 50 incubators and co working spaces in Austin. And if you read the list published by Forbes and everything, well, Chattanooga's come to life, Jacksonville's mm -hmm. come to life, Boise's a hotbed, Salt Lake City's going nuts. So, and entrepreneurs, when you're an entrepreneur and when you have an idea, you, you're blind to <laughs> obstacles. Uh, somebody said the thing that makes a visionary is a great many things they do not see, the obstacles <laughs> everybody else sees. And you know, I, I, people ask me, ones, right? I like start my first company in a recession and the interest rates are 15 percent. I yeah, we, we paid 17 percent yield on bonds we issued. I, I didn't didn't matter. <laughs> we broke all of our expectations and did great. And, you know, um, Great Depression. There were a lot of companies founded then, you know, most of the big trucking companies, the whole auto insurance industry, the rise of radio. There were boom industries. And you just, you don't pay attention to all that. Um, you try, in my case, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs and business people, you try to stay away from politics. They would write me. I remember one time there was a movement. Oh, it's about whether you could require a new hire to take a polygraph, something like that. Lighted. And, and some of the local retailers in Austin, oh, we need you to sign this petition to the state legislature, or whatever, to get this law enacted or and I, you know, I just wouldn't touch it. I didn't want anything to do with it. You know, uh, the further I could stay away from legislatures and regulators and mind my own business. And, and that, that came back to haunt, you know, like um, to some degree, both Microsoft and Walmart, when and I trust people started coming after them, they did not have a bunch of lobbyists in Washington. They were just, hey, that's your business. This is our business. And all of a sudden, oh, you're getting into our business. Because when you get big, you, you have a target on your back. But uh, no, no, there is no better time in history to be starting companies. There has never been better infrastructure. Every university has entrepreneurs and residents. There were zero when I started in entrepreneurship programs, free classes, online classes from great universities that are free. Uh, and the opportunities are just greater than they've ever been. You know, you just deal with it. You adapt, which you have to be doing every day in every aspect if you're building a business is adapting to changing environment changing customers, changing suppliers, supply chain issues. You know, a lot of them now wish they'd kept a little more money, you know, for rainy days, uh, COVID, because these big companies did stock buybacks and didn't keep all their cash around. And you need that for hard times and for innovation. So um, no, no, I, I'm not fond of the regulations. I, I certainly, I, I spoke to a group of entrepreneurs out in Southern California a little over a year ago. And several of them were just closing up shop and moving to Arizona, Nevada, or Texas, because they said, look, every day is a new regulation. And they're just everything we do, the size of the bathroom and who we got to hire and how much we got to pay them. And every day there's a new thing and we got to do the paperwork and the bigger you are, the more paperwork you have to do. Uh, you know, when it, what was the mandate going to be any company with over 100 employees or something like, hey, we got 102 employees. It's time to lay off three. Just like when they try to ban Walmart in the town, they say no stores over 100,000 square feet. So Walmart comes up with a 99,000 square foot prototype. You know, you got to be agile and adapt and and keep your business moving ahead with so you can promote people and give them a chance to grow and serve more customers. And um, so, yeah, the town, it, it's always tough. The challenges are, are just different. And hopefully our country will, uh, you know, the, my not so humble opinion, the uh, uh, elections in Virginia and New Jersey were kind of an indication people might want to uh, resist some of, the, some of the trends that are in the wind and on the news all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And um, speaking of, of California, did you see the new law that Gavin Newsom just signed about gender neutral toy section in toy oh, stores? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and their excuse as well. Retailers are already doing it. Target did it. So now we're just making everybody else come up because they were already doing it. Well, if they're already doing it, let them do it, you know? Mm -hmm. And if they don't want to do it, don't do it. And just nonsense. And, and now they're banning gasoline-powered lawnmowers and leaf right. blowers and everything. That's a nightmare. It means people get laid off because California is a huge market. And if you can't sell lawnmowers there anymore, the normal type, um, 
Yeah, no, no. And but yes. it's such a weird thing because they got Silicon Valley and they got all those billionaires. I, I have said at times, and I don't know if this is, would really be true or not, but Texas, of course, has had a lot of billionaires and all the old oil money and stuff. And when I looked at, well, California, you know, the states have a huge deficit and they have the biggest poverty inequality gap in the country and got all these issues. And then you got these billionaires, Silicon Valley. Why don't they step up and say, well, I'm going to I'm going to do this. I'll put a billion into our public schools or, or whatever, because I kind of feel like and I don't know for sure that Texans because the whole Texas thing, there's a lot of ego about being a Texan and a, I'm a migrant. I've been here 40 years, but I'm a Texan now. And I kind of feel like, hey, if the state was going broke, some of those, you know, the Ross Perot's of the world and stuff, you know, would step up and say, ah, Texas ain't going broke on my watch. You know, I'll put a billion dollars in to fund that, you know, that they'd step up and try to help the state. And I, I don't see that in California. If it's taking place, I haven't heard about it. Yeah, I think this is an interesting aspect of American history. I don't know if you, you've put much thought into it or, or um, study into it, but, um, you know, when when uh, <clears throat> when Tocqueville came to the United States and, yeah, and the man democracy in America and, and was it was, you know, doing his studies for that, he noticed that there was this incredible associationism among Americans. They'd come together to solve these problems. And now more and more people to look to government to solve every problem. And European you know, style. Yeah. It's a very big changing in culture. So um, no, hey, I just dashed over here from my week, my rotary meeting. And you know, whatever it is, two million people around the world, the biggest service organization on earth, uh, cured polio with uh, Bill and Melinda Gates contributed about billions of dollars, and now polio is down to one country in the world or something like that. It's taken years. Uh, just does all this good work, gives scholarships. And, and you look at churches, alumni associations, universities, we're still, we still love our, our clubs and our organizations and the best of them, you know, do a Red Cross, whatever, do a Salvation Army, do wonderful stuff. So now I, I was talking to one of the senior uh, deans at the University of Chicago, which I really, a place I love and great respect for. And he was saying he was meeting with like a rich Swiss banker or something. And the banker says to him, do you mean you're asking me to make a donation? And the dean says, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and the guy says, well, yeah, it's interesting. Nobody has ever asked me to donate money before in his life. Because in Europe, you assume if somebody's poor, the government's going to take care of them. If somebody's sick, the government's going to take care of them. They've driven out the private charity industry in large part. And it's just not, not in their minds. It never comes up. And uh, the U.S. is, you know, the most generous country in the world. If you look at the average donations of the average person yeah. and all that jazz. And then the big philanthropist, you know, no matter what you think of Bill Gates, he's really smart and he's really trying to do good things with his money. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, he's, yeah. uh, he might be frustrated with the investments he's made in school innovations because he was really big on that. But I've seen reports that, well, that billion didn't didn't pay off, you know. He may have had better luck dealing with malaria in Africa and some of the places where they've done such great things. Mm -hmm. Well, I like your optimism. I know I've read some things about mutual aid societies being far more prominent in early America. Perhaps uh, a lot of the, the charitable mindset has been overridden by this fact that we're forced essentially to give to charity through programs like welfare and, mm -hmm. and uh, social security. So but you mentioned University of Chicago. I know that you were there when uh, Milton Friedman was teaching. I'm wondering, was he a, a draw for you? Did you have classes with him? If so, what was yep. he like? No, I, I was blessed. Four of my teachers later won Nobel Prizes. Um, Eugene Fama, Robert Fogel, George Stigler, and Milton Friedman. And then I later became friends with Gary Becker, who also won a Nobel, one of the other great economists. No, it was wonderful. I mean, uh, today, it's something like, I want to say 40% or more of University of Chicago undergraduates are economics majors. So that works out to like 2000 or some big number like that. I think the year I got my bachelor's in economics, I think there were 40 of us, something like that. And we all took all graduate courses. So that's why I took all those guys and you had to go ask the professor, can I take your class? And you're an undergraduate, but you'd finished your first full year of a undergraduate econ. So I did about two thirds of the course, worked towards a master's degree, did a 
summer research grant, National Science Foundation on monopoly, which is my favorite field within economics. The great, my favorite teacher really was George Stigler, who uh, the economics of information, uh, uh, antitrust monopoly, industrial organization is a broad name for all that. And he's just a wonderful, wonderful man. He was Friedman's best friend, or certainly among them, old buddies. Uh, they were like Mutt and Jeff. Friedman was a little tiny, short fella, and Stigler was a great big tall fella. There's a famous picture of them walking across campus together. <laughs> um, but um, no, it was wonderful. And the, and the students were incredibly engaged. I was one of the few whose life goal was not to become an economist. You know, I, I just knew I didn't want to study business because I'd been reading Fortune magazine since I was 12 and I knew, understood business. So I worked in the graduate business school all four years and had more contacts with all those people and Fama and finance and all that. But, um, but University of Chicago did not and does not offer undergraduate business. And I have a lot of friends who have undergraduate business degrees and I don't wanna insult them, but I really believe that's trade school and is better done later or separately or, or on the job. Bill Gates, uh, Steve Jobs, Larry Ellison, Oracle, John Mack at Whole Foods. None of them have a bachelor's degree. I took one business course in my entire life. I don't know if John Mack even took one. You know, they learned on the job, you know, and things like marketing, you know, you get a marketing. Hey, marketing changes every hour. You know, the things that don't change, you, you you can learn in a couple of days or one good book, but then, oh, do we use billboards or do we use Snapchat to advertise or whatever? Um, <laughs> I, I, when you're talking about learning from business history, I say nothing that matters in business changes. Well, the techniques and the technologies change continually and the customer changes, but the things that matter, putting customers first, treating your employees right, you know, picking good locations if you're in retailing or restaurants, those things are timeless and, and all the mistakes that can be made have been made. And if you study business history, you're gonna learn how they thought. And then another thing is a lot of ideas go away, die off and then people rediscover them. You know, it's like the loyalty card thing, which is huge in retelling, but it was really American Airlines that led the way in my mind, as far as getting everybody hooked in their system with their advantage and frequent flyer points. And the other airlines followed along but the American system was early and huge. But if you go back to the 1920s, we had a thing called S&H green stamps, which is a, just really the same concept. You shop me more often, I'm gonna give you something and you can turn that stuff into to money, into buying stuff, you know? So this idea of some sort of method to get people hooked. A and P, the great supermarket chain, I think probably as far back as the 1890s, you could order tea from them in the mail, but if you grouped your neighbors together and bought more, then you got a big discount. And then you got your, you were a part of the system, a member in a sense. So very few ideas are really brand new. And if you study business history, you get all these, wow, I never thought of it that way. Every time I read the history of a great company, even in the 19th century, I'll say, when, you know, there's a business idea to do that today because nobody's doing that. I have a, I've got over 300 business ideas in little tablets. Started keeping a list when I was 12 and it still continues to grow with, uh, oh, wow, there's an opportunity there. What is your, so you work with, with John Mackey at Whole Foods for a bit. What is your view of the morality of capitalism? Oh, you know, I think it's, I mean, I guess it's all relative because I never say companies are perfect or that any company or mm-hmm. all companies are perfect. But the, the idea that it's voluntary you know, nobody, no company can make me buy their products. No company can make me work for them. I will only go to work for them if going to work for them is better than all the alternatives that are open to me, right? And this is true of every worker at Walmart and everything. You know, a lot of the workers at Walmart, people don't like to talk about it, but they have left independent mom and pop stores because Walmart offers better benefits and a better chance to move up. If you're good and you like what you're doing, you can become a millionaire at Walmart. You know, they've created lots of them with their stock program, but store managers can become very wealthy and they have thousands of those and people don't talk about that, but it's voluntary. Yet I was talking last night, I had dinner with friends and the case in one of their relatives, Walmart wanted to buy food from products from them and they refused to sell to them because they didn't want to become captive of Walmart. That's their right. And they've continued and prospered and sold to other places. Um, 
there are brands that won't sell to Walmart. You know, Sherwin Williams Paint has their own stores. You won't find it in Home Depot or Lowe's. They make separate brands. They sell to those guys, you know. Uh, uh, but it's all voluntary. And the world of government and politics is about involuntary. You know, they have the, the power of the gun and the power of jails behind them. And when they say you got to do this, so, uh, you know, I remember I'd have arguments back in the 60s. And then, you know, the anti-corporate, anti-business thing was huge then as it's, I think it was bigger then than now, but both times pretty grim. And, you know, and oh, Soviet Union. I said, well, you know, the Soviet Union has one automaker. You know, they make three brands, but they have one automaker called the Soviet government. And they make the worst cars in the world. And they, they look like 30 old American cars. And I said, and, and we have three car makers this is back in the days of the big three, GM, Ford, and Chrysler. And I'm like, so which would you rather have? You know, yeah, because they were saying, oh, GM's too big and everything. This is awful, oligopoly. I'm like, well, would you rather have three or have one? And mm. compare the quality. And back then, the quality of the American cars was, was wonderful, although they were big and used a lot of gas and it took the Japanese competition and Germans of Beetle to wake up the American automakers, which they eventually did after a lot of struggle. So, no, so nobody's perfect, but the, the chance to, to, to make your own choices. Um, you know, Milton Friedman used to talk about- um, Free to choose. Yeah, and, and you know, what, one article he wrote, maybe for New York Times, uh, you can find PDFs of it around, I've got it somewhere. But he said, what if we ran our grocery stores like we run our schools? Mm. So you have to go to this grocery store because it's the one close to your house. And you have to take whatever they're offering. You can't shop at any other grocery store. And I've written uh, before in my first book and stuff about, uh, I said the best and worst run industries in America. I said the best run, in my opinion, is the food distribution industry. From a hot dog stand and 7-Eleven to the very finest restaurants to all the grocery stores and Trader Joe's and niche markets and Costco giving great value on food and Walmart, now the biggest food retailer on earth. Uh, to uh, Wegmans, have you heard of them? A wonderful mm -hmm. uh, family owned Rochester, New York base that runs really the best grocery stores in America and probably the world. Amazing company. Publix down in Florida, owned by the employees, made a lot of the employees rich. HEB, a big one here in Texas, a family owned, wonderful company. Um, you just have all that diversity. I mean, look at all the places you can buy a sandwich and, and they're all over the board. And, and it's safe. How often do you hear somebody dying from something they got at a grocery store or a restaurant with all the millions of food that people eat? And, you know, they pay well. I mean, hey, the grocery stores, you know, uh, they, they, they take really good care of their people. Costco is the lowest margin retailer in America as far as the profit margin they make on what they sell, but it also is the highest paying. Those cashiers, I think, are making like 60 grand a year. Once they've been there a while, oh, you know, oh yeah, no, 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 they, Costco really pays. Wow. And every retail company has different philosophy because I don't think Sam's, their competitor, pays as well as Costco. But on the other hand, I was talking to Target managers. See, our challenge is we don't pay as well as Walmart, you know, but Target's known as a wonderful company that really treats people well. So they, they attract people. Um, I don't know, as far as the morality of it as well, Churchill or whatever, you know, hey, it's not a very good system, but it's by far the best one we've ever invented. And, um, and, and when it's done right, you know, like one of my favorite companies, UPS, you know, 200,000 drivers, Teamsters Union members making 100 grand a year apiece, waiting line to become a driver, incredible company pride, very good labor relations overall over their history, delivers an amazing service at a good price and pays all these people really well and runs like a machine. It's just amazing. It's a, and it was started by a guy who borrowed a hundred bucks when he was a teenager and spent his whole life, lived into his nineties, making UPS successful. He never married, he never had a house. He lived out of hotels. So he could go in the office and be in the trucks all the time. Jim Casey, I wrote up his biography, uh, unknown you know, hero. But that, that's one of the greatest companies on earth. If you really look at it the way I do, how, how well run it is, how well it does its function how focused it doesn't get, oh, we're going to change our company name every day, you know, and <laughs> oh, we don't know what we're doing, like in the Enron or whatever, if you remember them. Um, so, uh, no, I can't think of anything more moral or virtuous. And, well, you know, people, oh, I went into public service. 
you know, mm-hmm. uh, became a, a, a congressperson or a, a, a mayor. And did Steve Jobs not do a public service? Does UPS not do a public service? Does Target not do a public service every day? Did a- Apple not do a public service? The greatest public servants in world history are the people who built great enterprises. Or they're certainly right up there with your great political leaders. I I can take issue when they say, oh, he runs the country. Joe Biden doesn't run the country. Donald Trump didn't run the country. Richard Nixon didn't run the country. Countries run by us. Lots of us make an independent free will choices where to buy, where to shop, who to work for. Uh, who to give money to charities. Um, yeah, and, and this country is still great. I'm always an optimist. There's just no payoff in being a pessimist. What are you going to do? You <laughs> just go out and you know shoot yourself or whatever? I mean, no, no. There's no return on emotional investment in that. And over time, the optimists have always been proven right. In, it's the uh, great you know, world The capitalist progress. equivalent of Pascal's wager. It's optimism yeah. in business. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So after Bookstop, uh, you went on to Hoover's or what became Hoover's, um, the, I think it was the reference library. The reference the, Press, yes. Right. Reference so Press. We were going to become the Webster's of business. Well, if you walked into a bookstore and I, uh, my 60,000 books are 99.9% nonfiction, reference books, books full of data and everything. Most of the people, over half the people going to bookstore are looking for information. So maybe 30 or 40% are people looking for entertainment, fiction, Mm. although you can learn a lot from fiction. Uh, But on the other hand, they're coming in saying, what hotel do I stay at in India? How do I recognize this kind of bird in my yard? Uh, How do I learn to program in Java? How do I learn to quit smoking? How do I cook? Cookbooks are huge, recipe books. You know, it's people, you know, what what was the history of the world series or who who won the elections in that year? And and a bookstore with the books we had in the store and still today can answer all those questions. But they came in and said, is Toyota or GM bigger? Or I'm a a Air Force pilot and I now want to go to work in the airline industry. Should I go to work for Pan Am or Southwest? Mm -hmm. Those answers weren't there. You had to go to big multi-thousand dollar reference books at the library called Moody's Manuals and Standard and Poor's Manuals. And I collect those going back to actually 1880s. And they're in the um, free book section of your website, right? Uh, some of them are. Whenever I found a Google digitization of them, mm-hmm. I've got them under free books. We now have hundreds and I just that. discovered another great one I got to add. So, but most of them have not been scanned. There are three, 4,000 page books with dense type. Yeah. They're incredibly heavy. They're so cool. I can look up any history of any company, their financial history. But the thing is that information is not available to the general public. And they had all these airline uh, pilots coming out of the Air Force. Oh, go to work for Pan Am. It's big, it's old, it's famous. Well, it was going broke. They're all out of work four years later, 10 years later. Whereas if you're gonna work for Southwest, which was just a little guy people were barely paying attention to, you'd still have a job today, you know? Uh, I guess you'd be retired by now. But the thing is, um, people need to know that these companies affect our lives. And, and even if you hate them, because I had those debates in the 60s and I would stay up all night debating with my Marxist friends and, and they're, they're like, oh, these companies, they do this and this and this. I said, no, you don't understand companies. I said, they don't do that, but they do this that you don't realize. And if you really want to attack them, read this article you understand because i understood companies from reading all those fortunes i knew more about their weaknesses and the things they did wrong than their enemies did it's just like milton friedman would debate in class with a marxist and there were students who had higher iqs than milton in those classes you know and he would obliterate them in any debate because he had studied marx more carefully and understood him better than any of the young marxists so you know understand your enemy. So even this, this, we came out with Hoover's handbook, a guide to the 542 most important companies in the world and their history, list of their officers, how much they were paid, list of their competitors. Those are features that nobody else had ever done in a business reference book. And then uh, a, a college friend that I'd started my first company, the bus company together with 20 some years earlier, I turned it over to him because he wanted to migrate it from book publishing to being online. And online was just beginning. This was 19, 1991, 92, 93 before Amazon. And so Hoover's and and then was renamed Hoover's went public and Dun and Bradstreet bought it, but became a huge source for information about companies. We just kept adding more companies. And but the original idea was a $20 book in the bookstores. Now 
uh, you can't buy it. And, and it's uh, kind of ironic because my goal was to make information about companies available to the mass market. Mm-hmm. And I, I failed in achieving that goal. We, and I was on the board. I voted for it. But we morphed from being a B2C to consumer company to B2B because we found out, oh, Ernst & Young will pay us 100 grand a year to put our information on all their desktops or whatever. And so it went from being $100 a year to $5,000 a year uh, or whatever for subscriptions. And I, and I, I didn't vote against that because it was the right evolution for the company and to grow it and opportunity. But it means maybe I should go back and start the whole yeah. thing again. Because go to a bookstore and it's right where it was then. You can't find that information. And the idea was an annual, an almanac. The World Almanac is still one of my favorite books. I get it every year when it comes out. All that data in one affordable book. So really the world still needs what, <laughs> what I wanted to deliver. On yeah, the other hand, the bookstore, superstore idea that, that was Barnes and Noble did a great job of carrying that out. And, and now mm-hmm. they're, they got a new owner and they're, um, I think coming back, I just spent time talking to one of their top managers and things are looking up, but boy, it was a rough ride uh, and borders, the big competitor, great company. They yeah. went under. Mm-hmm. I remember, I remember borders, but yeah, you're right. This source of information for just you and me, the, the average consumer at this point, it's not there. Like I can't think of it. Well, I do have to say, I wasn't thinking about that, but I do have to say Yahoo finance, Google finance. There is a lot more free, but not always of the quality Mm -hmm. and consistency that we were doing at Hoover's because we were anal retentive. I mean, we, we were really (laughs) into dotting the I's and crossing the T's and making sure every, everything in that book was right. And it, it took like 40 writers to create that first book. Wow incredible and i love the like the, the the original like dun and bradstreet that came from the american uh Mer- mercantile or the mercantile mm-hmm. exchange it's right. by lewis tappan right mm-hmm. yeah no no you got it he was the first guy and uh, yeah and, and that's an important part of our infrastructure and i remember talking to entrepreneurs in mexico i lead tours in mexico city and i teach in mexico i love it down there i love the people and you know, they say, well, we don't know who to trust when we're selling, you know, manufacturing company selling somebody. So they have to pay everything cash up front. And, and even though I looked up and Dun & Bradstreet does operate down there, man, when I was there, either people weren't using it or didn't trust it or it didn't cover every company. But it was a real challenge to not have. And that credit rating system is a, is a key part. And if you look at some where they rate which countries are best to do business in, I'm pretty sure one of the elements they were using was do they have good national credit reporting? Because uh, once you know you know who you can trust, or these guys always pay their bills, and you can give them 30, 60 days credit, and that changes everything. That, yes. That's key source of capital for any entrepreneur. You've got to wonder like how American business would have sort of gotten on without Lewis Tapp and coming up with this idea of a, of a credit rating agency, you know, an antebellum period. It's very, very early. So this actually brings me to the question. So why do you think it's important to study business history? Yeah, it's really just, um, John, learning from the greats, getting inspired. I mean, like, you know, I've taught entrepreneurship for quite a while. I was entrepreneur in residence at the University of Texas McCombs Business School uh, for a year. And I've mentored thousands. I've seen tens of thousands of business plans or some huge number like that. And the best way to learn entrepreneurship is to study the greats because you learn how they thought, you learn how they came up with new ideas, uh, and you, you got to try to adapt that to your situation. But think, well, gosh, if he, that man or woman, if, if Estee Lauder was here now, she was one of the ones I wrote up with her cosmetics empire, amazing, the passion she had and everything. And you understand the role of passion. You understand they make big mistakes. Uh, they face big obstacles. They overcome incredible obstacles. Nobody will deal with them. Nobody will answer them, whatever. Um, how they dealt with that. You learn that they aren't all geniuses. You know, we see Jobs and Gates and Bezos. And you know, a lot of these were, Henry Ford was just a tinker, you know, just kept playing with the machines and everything. And many of the others were. So you really learn so much. And people love reading biography overall. People, was it Emerson that said all history is biography? I think it was him. But so um, it's just the best way and it's inspirational, you know? But also there are times you realize, well, gosh, I'm starting my company, I'm out of money. I'm gonna have to mortgage my house. My spouse is about to leave me over it. I'm depressed. 
Well, then you find out, oh, gosh, all these other guys were depressed, too. F.W. Woolworth, his first venture failed. The man who created the dime store and built a huge organization that's no longer with us now, but it was a huge moneymaker a long time. He built the world's tallest building and owned it outright. But when he failed his first business, he went back to his parents' house and locked himself in his bedroom and cried for two months or something like that. And was known to have crying fits his entire life. <laughs> so yeah, they're human. They're human. And you got to understand that they aren't geniuses. They aren't wizards. They weren't born entrepreneurs. They didn't break the mold. You know, they're all very unique. Some were nice people, some less nice people. Some had wonderful home lives. Conrad Hilton, one of my favorites, his book, Be My Guest, I read as a kid, how he built the Hilton Hotel. Just an amazing guy. But his home life was a disaster. Mm -hmm. Just his marriage life and his kids overall was really awful because he was so focused on the business. Um, so, you know, and then others, you know, um, had wonderful family and home life and all that. So you just learn, hey, we're all different, but we face a lot of the same challenges. Nobody believes us when we have a new idea. Nobody wants to invest in us. Nobody will ship us. You know, how do we convince customers that our cool new thing? And then all the marketing, you study George Eastman, his biography, I man who built Kodak. I said the greatest technology entrepreneur in American history. And he, like Steve Jobs and also Watson, father and son who built IBM, was one of the very few that understood technology, was an inventor himself, but was a brilliant marketer and understood branding and came up with that name Kodak and then the or, uh, yellowish logo which went all over the world and probably achieved the highest market share of any closest to monopoly of any company in american history that wasn't backed by the government so like when the government said yeah at&t were on your side right. and they reached this agreement in the early days of at&t well 80 85 percent of all the telephones in america were at&t you know the bell system before they broke it up and pan american world airways in many ways was like a government backed thing it was a branch of the state department was the only U.S. airline that could fly into all these cities around the world until after World War II and TWA and some of the other guys fought their way into it. But Pan Am, so, you know, and then any, any kind of government-backed monopoly, government, public schools, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, there aren't, there are, there are like no monopolies in America today. People throw that word around all the time. Monopoly means 100% market ownership. Google doesn't have that. Facebook doesn't have that. Plus, the government doesn't know, the regulators are awful at how to define a market. When, when Bezos was testifying in front of Congress, he said, yeah, but we compete with Walmart, which is a far bigger company than we are. The Congress people said, oh, don't bring that up. That's not real. Hey, that's very real. Mm -hmm. And Walmart.com is the company to watch, among others, in the future of American retailing as they rise up and really take on Amazon increasingly head on every day. And they have all these, all these suppliers want Walmart to succeed because they don't want to have one customer. They don't want to be just the totally dependent on Amazon. So, uh, and, and I can show you, Walmart buys more Heinz ketchup and more Coca-Cola and all these big companies far more than Amazon sells and just through their retail network. But if they really move strongly, they can be coming across. And Amazon needs competition. Great companies need competition. Alfred Sloan, the GM guy, when Henry Ford had messed up his, he just stuck around too long, ran it too long, mm -hmm. didn't keep up with the times. He died and his grandson, Henry II, took over in the early 50s, took the company public, it had been family owned all. That's why the Ford Foundation, the Fords are so rich still. And Alfred P. Sloan, his big enemy and competitor, called him up and gave him names of some of the key General Motors executives to that Henry Ford II, the grandson, should hire. And he did. And he, because Alfred Sloan knew that he needed a strong Ford Motor Company. He needed a strong competitor. And to be frank, the government was coming after GM for having a monopoly. So he said, well, we need somebody to take some market share from us. It gets very complex. But there have been also retailers, Sears and Pennies, both. They wanted strong competition and took moves to make sure their competitors were strong. Um, and, uh, and so Amazon needs a strong competitor. The re UPS and FedEx are two of the greatest companies in the world. Coca-Cola and PepsiCo are two of the greatest companies in the world. That's because they have each other. They would never admit that. You know, I've spoken to UPS people and FedEx people and they, they act like they hate each other, but the people at the top understand, I, I hope, but it's certainly true that Having that a competitor that good is a blessing. And, uh, and it's true, magazines, newspapers, media, movies, music, 
competition's great. We just need it in schools. We need it more in healthcare. Um, yeah, let people rise up, let people innovate. Um, it's hard to beat, hard to beat. The government does some things well, sometimes seems like very few, because you, you obviously you say, well, they do the military well, and then you know, the recent Afghanistan thing, but government does not do innovation well. Yeah, and, and granted, the Department of Defense and NASA uh, brought us a lot, of, but a lot of that was done through contracts with private companies. Mm -hmm. It was North American Rockwell doing the space work, and it was these computer companies working with the Defense Department and gave us the internet and everything. So, but there, you know, I don't want to deny that. But hey, of all the innovations we have from the telephone and electricity and, you know, radio and uh, hey, it's private enterprise. It's pioneering entrepreneurs, brave inventors. Um, and that's, that's how we get progress. And that's how, why we are so much richer globally than we have ever been in history. And are getting, a friend of mine, Larry Siegel wrote a book called Fewer, Richer, Greener. If you haven't read it, you should get it. Wonderful okay. book. And it's about the future of the world and how there are going to be fewer people than we expected, that population growth is not an issue, um, that we're going to be richer globally, worldwide, all of us, and it's going to be a greener, a more environmentally safe world. And he, he is a, a University of Chicago graduate, big believer, he's a you know, big believer in free markets and all that. But the book's full of history and data, it's just wonderful. Fewer, richer, greener. It's on Amazon. Great. Yeah, we'll link to that in the show notes as well. Great. He's kind of up there with Stephen Pinker, Matt Ridley, uh, you know, some of the other people look at the future with optimism, which the world really needs. I need that. Yeah, I love that you're bringing that up. And, you know, I love that you're doing this work with American Business History. You started uh, American Business History Center in 2019. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like a bit of a passion project. Oh, that's um, for sure. It's what I'm doing the rest of my life. I'm 70. <laughs> so, you know, you just need another project. Now, this one doesn't, you know, it's a 501c3. I think I figured I've gotten between one and three dollars an hour for all the time I put in. <laughs> write a free weekly newsletter. And some of those are taking like 40, 50 hours of research. Uh, try to try to do a good job. Um, yeah. And our traffic, I just looked. We're running like five times as many uh, visits to the website as we were a year ago. Our newsletter subscriptions are up like 50% in the last four or five months. Uh, no, no, people are, and we're ranking high in Google. Uh, I've been on the History Channel on five or six of their programs. I got publicity, uh, podcasts like this, the video cast. I've done more and more. Uh, one, a fellow had two million listeners, and man, that really kicked up our traffic. And I and I'm a believer because I I've been involved in non, but I lost all my money on my third venture a travel superstore but before I did I gave the University of Chicago enough they named a dormitory after me so I believe in nonprofits the the right ones the well run ones and when I die my library will become a giant used bookstore and the proceeds will go to different colleges and the Cato Foundation and a few other people like that Cato Institute whatever but. Um, uh, uh, where was I going with that? The um, uh, yeah, you the, started this passion project. A, a few yeah, years yeah. Back. And so, you guys have got to definitely subscribe to the newsletter. I I subscribed, and this article that you wrote on Alfred Sloan is just incredible. Well, so great. Well, thanks. Oh yeah, no, no. I hey, we we uh, work at it, but oh, where I was leading. So the nonprofit world, I'm very familiar with, and sat on a lot of boards. Well, I got friends spend eighty percent of their time raising money, and. I'm, I'm really old school. I told friends the other night at dinner, I spent my entire life trying not to be fashionable, you know, and not to be cool. <laughs> Make sure I would never be, you know, like, uh, like everybody else. But all this raising money and raising more money and then the big projects and spending it. And my thing is build a great product, build a great product. And I'm not going to live forever. So my whole thing is we are going to create great content. And I spend uh, half of 1% of my energy over those since we founded it has been spent on raising money. You know, <laughs> few emails. We haven't raised, I don't know, what was 60,000 altogether. We gave a lot of it, some of it away in a high school essay contest we had and just had the winners. They wrote great, write up the history of the local business to get young people interested in business and also writing skills and history, history of business. And um, so my whole thing is just focus. Let's make a great product. 
And if we do that sooner or later, Better Mousetrap will draw people to us. And so the first year, our website views didn't go anywhere. They were flat for a year and a half. And then all of a sudden, people started finding NBC News read one of the articles and called me up. The History Channel read a biography of H.J. Hines, said, oh, can you come on our series, The Food That Built America? And, and it's just begun to pick up really in the last uh, five months and, and really take off. And I don't know where it's going to be in five or 10 years, but it's going to be huge. And even if I don't raise a penny, it's going to be huge because my partners, there's four of us, but two of us do most of the work. Um, it's, it's just going to be big, you know, and, and then money will flow and whoever follows me can decide if they want to raise more money. And, and I, we would like to build a, a physical museum, but not a fancy one. I study that industry in depth. They spend way too much money on buildings and not enough money on really storytelling, uh, you know, uh, what, what helps the customer as opposed to what looks good in the architecture competition or makes the donors proud. And I love beautiful buildings. I love architecture, but uh, I can go. I've written articles online about how to bring museums in the 20th century. I've, I've 21st century. I visit 600 of them worldwide. Raised seven million towards a museum project, a for-profit one. Hit the recession of 08 and couldn't raise the rest of the money. Had to cancel the project. But so ours is a very different approach. You know, we're not about fundraising. We're not about a gala ball. Maybe that'll come along someday. But just about getting people interested, getting people engaged, get, and we do it through text. And we talk about podcasts. We do have some cool videos on there, the histories of the retail industry, auto industry, computer industry, airlines, movies, magazines, broadcasting. Uh, and, the, and they're, they're great, I think. You know, I did them, so I'm biased. But the thing is um, really writing text. And we're coming out with a book this year that's 34 of our favorite articles. Bedtime business stories, it's going to be called. It should be out in December on Amazon. We're just finalizing all that. So um, just to get people to realize how important it is and, and how, how interesting, you know, uh, I, I, the, the life of Adolf Zukor, the guy that created Paramount Pictures, invented the movie star, invented the feature film, lived to be 103, foresaw television and was much more open to it than all the other movie guys lost control in the depression, but they kept him around because he was such a visionary, amazing guy. And man, that would just make a wonderful movie. Yeah, I've got, uh, there's a guy, Sam Insull, the most hated entrepreneur in American history, wrote him up. I almost went to prison for things he didn't do because the politicians had to use him as a scapegoat in the depression, but amazing. He lowered the price of electricity for everybody in America and uh, just amazing guy. They would make such wonderful movies or mini series. And, and to be frank, even the History Channel, they, they don't always get it all right. They don't mm -hmm. always have the best historians or the script writer who wants to draw. You know, they take a license, you know, with the stories and just like epic movies do, you know, Lawrence of Arabia or Ben Hur, whatever they are. Well, I guess Ben Hur wouldn't. Was it real? I don't think so. It was all a novel. But, you know, Lawrence of Arabia or Gandhi, they, they take some liberties the on the history. Mm -hmm. There's whole books about how accurate are the movie epics, but these business stories are as exciting, you know, they're competitions, you know, we love basketball and football and baseball and everything and soccer, but the competition between Chevy and Ford affects more people's lives by far affects whether people earn a living or not has been going on for a hundred years is intense is still intense. And there's a scoreboard. And so for me, even from being a kid was like, yeah, I do love Indiana basketball, but oh man, <laughs> this GM Ford thing, this Coke Pepsi thing, this Macy's Gimbals thing, this Sears Wards thing, you know, this Hertz Avis thing, that's, that's even cooler, you know, and to watch it and the score, it only comes out every three months, you know, but you can watch it <laughs> and, and it changes Tesla versus the whole auto industry, you know, um, new players come in the game. Uh, and that's human. It's human. People losing all their money, people becoming fabulously wealthy, and then either giving it all away or spending it all and they're broke again. Um, no, if I hadn't become a retailer, I would have been a social scientist. And the thing about retailing, it's just like, you know, engineering is applied physics or whatever, you know. Retailing is applied social sciences. Every day, especially when you're building a retail chain, you're doing geography. 
economics, anthropology, sociology, and psychology, and demography, however you want to categorize it. Every day, you're putting those ideas to work, to work excuse me, and learning. And, and I, I have loved that. I have a book here somewhere I got as probably 10th birthday present or something that social sciences, you know, is a book made for, for kids. But it went through each of those and showed, oh, here's the kind of things they do. A psychology I love and poli sci, poli sci comes in. But of course, as a University of Chicago guy, I don't really think there's a separate poli sci in economics. There's mm -hmm. political economy, as we would mm -hmm. like to say. But uh, and and you're 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 living that and you're seeing how it changes every day and and just studying people and that that's a big challenge with a lot of investors venture capitalists private equity people the elites people in washington they really have no feel for like r real people you know a lot of them wouldn't be caught dead in walmart and you can't understand america without hanging out in walmart <laughs> something like 80 percent of american people shop walmart regularly you know you, you, you almost can't avoid it in most of america now there's not one in manhattan i don't even know if they've got one in new york city because they tried to keep them out but and now i shop out in the country i shop dollar general like twice a week and i had not i knew about the company i've been in a few stores because i love retailing but i hadn't really shopped them and you learn a lot when you're really in there every day and how well run they are. And it's an amazing company. They're opening three new stores a day this year, a thousand new stores this year. And I think they, they did close to a thousand last year, even during COVID. Oh, they're just going nuts. And they're in many ways, just a wonderful company. And, um, and people look down on them or whatever. But man, if you aren't eating at the diners and stopping at the truck stops and hanging out at Walmart or hanging out at CVS and Walgreens, you can't know. And that was always a challenge. My first job out of college, stock analyst on Wall Street. For big institutional investors, Citibank. Uh, we were one of the biggest institutional investors in covering retail. And, and I go to the portfolio managers and you know and say, hey, here's a good retail stock and everything. And so often it was so hard for them to relate because first of all, men don't shop as much. Wealthy people don't shop as much. Wealthy men, least of all. And so you got these country club, Long Island and New Jersey guys and Westchester people and, and overwhelmingly men that began to change when I was on Wall Street and, and nice people and very bright and lots of wonderful degrees. But when you talk to them about what drove a McDonald's or a Walmart or back then Kmart, or he, they had a little more feel for Sears because Sears sold them their lawnmowers and tools and things. But even so, they, they really just didn't have a clue how the world really worked. And, and so it takes a special kind of person to be the CEO of a Walmart or a Target. You know, the kind of people that run Google and run Facebook, uh-uh, uh-uh, you know, and, uh, and, I, and I love it. I, you go to retail convention, they're just the best people, they're polite, go to a restaurant show and you'll see senior executive from McDonald's right next to a person that owns one food truck. And, and they all treat each other well because they're in the business of serving others. And they think that serving others is the highest value you can have. And that can be pretty rare in the world. You know, when I hire people, well, I go out, be at a restaurant, find a really good um, waiter or waitress and say, hey, if you ever want to go to work for a bookstore, you know, call me. Because you're always, and, and when you go into like, you'll go in the shop, go in a shopping mall or something with other people, watch every person. Are they the kind of person that goes through the door and, doesn't look behind them, lets the door slam in the next person's face, or are they the person that's always aware of the people around them and what their needs are? And you're always looking for that, the, the kind of people who have the heart of a nurse, the heart of a flight attendant, the heart of a, the believe that serving others is really cool and really satisfying um, and, and finding those people. And that's what makes great retailers. But, you know, there, there are a lot of people and a lot of companies full of people where, where nobody thinks like that, you know, so how am I going to get ahead and how am I going to get rich and how can I work fewer hours? And I, I would always get a kick when I go around at Christmas and you, you go to my bookstores, you know, and I go to the post office to mail a Christmas gift or whatever. And I'd ask the bookstore, I'd say, well, how, how's it going? Ah, oh, it's going great. It's Christmas, Christmas, best time of the year. You know, got out of here at 3 a.m. last night. You go to the post office and say, well, how's it going? Oh, uh, it's Christmas, you know, worst time of the year. You know, I had to stay late last night. Hey, 
It's it's all in your head. It's mm-hmm. all in, it's all in your heart. It's all in your attitude. You know, for for us retailers, having to work around the clock in December is just wouldn't wouldn't trade anything in the world for it. it, it restaurant people, ninety five percent of the people working at McDonald's are doing it to learn how to show up to work on time and a mm-hmm. basic job and everything, and then move on with their lives and never want to see another hamburger, whatever. Five percent of them or two percent of them, whatever, love it and become millionaires when they own their own McDonald's. You know, Jeff Bezos started at McDonald's. A whole lot of, there's a whole book of people whose first job was McDonald's. And now they're smart enough to run ads saying America's first, best Best first job job or something like that. Yeah, brilliant. And that's, you know, right on. Um, But even stockbrokers, I looked into that because I love the stock market. and I've been interested in it since I was a little kid. But I I, I couldn't really do it because you have to sit at a desk maybe that's changed in the internet age but because i like to travel building a retail chain you're always flying around the country but anyway i looked into it and uh, man they they can pay really well you know in fact when i talked to them I said well you name what you want to make and we'll pay you that but you just get that for two or three years and then you you have to be making enough commissions to support you but then you know you ask around and well 90 percent of the people that went into that program leave don't or whatever 70 percent are gone within a year it's not for them Mm-hmm. But the people who love being a stockbroker, who spend a lifetime in it, I mean, they really have to screw up to not retire rich. You know, if you're if you're a good stockbroker and work at it for years, um, you do really, really well. Now, that, again, may change now with all free trades. The world's always changing. But, uh, you know, people just uh, there's no excuse for people in the United States of America to do a job they don't love. You can't get it right away. You may have to do jobs you don't like get your training or whatever uh, especially when you first get out of school but ultimately it's a tragedy when i see people that hate their jobs and that's Absolutely. true in every field and there's really no excuse for it no there, there's like almost nobody in america that only has one job option there's mm-hmm. nobody that has one career option it's just a matter of do you do you want to change it and try it um and and as you know there's millions of jobs going begging right now i mean there's huge bigger opportunities than ever a labor shortage a a seller's market wages are rising and they're going to keep going up all the target walmart all those guys oh we'll we'll go 12 no we'll go 14 we'll go 15 you know i mean they're like in a race and then you have the house and senate saying no we need a minimum wage of 25 dollars an hour (laughs) oh no yeah Uh, just totally don't have a clue don't have a clue about how you build an economy. And, and that's largely true of both parties. Yeah. So for those who are in a job right now that they're not fond of or the, uh, yeah. W- what sort of steps, what principles would you recommend that they follow to either make the job they have now better or get a better one? Yeah. Well, if I start back, like when they're just getting out of college or even high school, because not everybody needs college, at the early stages, because they're most of those people don't know what their life's passion are. Right? I mean, look at what you are passionate about. I mean, if you're really passionate about music, there are opportunities in the music business. I, I know pe- people all the time. They're passionate about animals. Well, there's a lot of money being a veterinarian or a, a kennel, the right kennel. And there are opportunities in every field. Do as many internships as you can. Try different things. Uh, talk to everybody you know, talk to your friends, parents. When I thought I loved retailing, I was going to go into it. It was 13 and 14. I went to Kmart, Sears, the local independent mom and pop stores. Talk to the managers. What do you like about your job? What don't you like? What's the best day you've ever had? What's the worst day you've ever had? Uh, what kind of person you look for to work in your retail stores? I just asked all these questions and kept notes. And, and, and over a couple of years, realized, oh, yeah, this is the field I want to go into. This just sounds like great. So, you know, talk to people why they, and, and look in their eye. Do they love their job? I, I was meeting, it was a boyfriend of a daughter of a friend of mine. I was at their house. And, oh, the young man. And so what's your dad? Oh, he's an economist, University of Texas. Oh, that's cool. I've studied economics. And I said, so, and, the, and this kid says, oh, yeah, and he just won a big award. His paper won some big prize. Oh, that's great. I said, so what's your father's specialty? Because, you know, economics, like every, every other academic field, is divided in all these micro categories. I said, what's his specialty? Oh, I don't know. I'll have to ask him. And I just realized that 
the father doesn't come home from work and talk about his work and be excited. My dad's old glassware for the last 19 years of his life, salesman and sales manager, but, and, and he'd been a wholesale grocer and a retail grocer, the son of a preacher. Hey, I knew every model of glassware that company sold. I knew all of his big customers. I knew the joys of him being on the road and traveling to, you know, 50 states and going to trade shows and how he could under, he could guess where somebody was from by their second sentence because back then he had these regional dialects and he knew all these key words and pronunciations. And he loved what he did. He thought he was making the world a better place by selling 39 cent banana split dishes and ice trays and iced tea tumblers and whatever that were affordable. You could buy them at Woolworths or Sears or Kmart, you know, and that, that was giving people great joy for very little money. And it was a mission from God, you know, and people, the people don't love their jobs. They don't bring, and you could, so if you went around, you say, I'm thinking about this industry. Let me go talk to 10 people in this industry. You can look in their eyes. You can hear them. You say, oh, is it a good industry? Well, I don't know. There are a lot of cheats in it. You know, or, oh, no, it's a rat race. Or would you go into it again if you were young? And, um, uh, and, and that's a big problem with people understanding business in our society is business leaders and executives and business owners do not communicate to their own family the importance and value of what they do. And that's Amen. a serious problem in this country. I don't think people talk about. Some do, but on the other hand, and, and let's face it, you have, you know, Goldman Sachs partners and stuff that are really leftist, you know, John Corzine or Corzine that was governor of New Jersey. Um, so a lot of them, especially in, among invet George Soros doesn't believe in capitalism. If you really right. look at where he puts his checks, I don't, he doesn't, because he's an investor, it's different from being an operator, from running a company, hiring and firing large numbers of people and building an organization. Uh, it isn't quite the same when you run a private equity fund or something, but, but there are still a lot of parents who, who do believe in capitalism, but they don't show it and they don't, and they need to tell because, Hey, I, I've hung out back when I was a kid, but even in more recent years with real student radicals on the left and the railing one, I'm saying, Oh, it's totally unfair that I'm rich enough. I can go to the university of Chicago and not these other people. And I'm like, well, blame your parents. But, you know, you with me, I mean, their parents are the ones that made the money that paid that. That's their fault for making her rich enough to go and that she was so upset about. But, you know, I'm, I'm, even in the 60s, I would turn and say, OK, all these big companies are evil. What's your father do? What's your father do? What's your father do? And, you know, 70 percent or 50 percent were corporate executives. And they obviously had never had the kind of dinner table conversations that I got, you know. Mm -hmm. And because uh, I hey, as a child of the 60s, I'm like, well, what good are you doing, Dad? You're making glassware. And that's <laughs> the answer I got was he created a thousand jobs in this little town of uh, 2000 people or whatever wow. by growing the company 30 fold in their annual sales over a that's period incredible. of 19 years. And that and so I, OK, you got a point there, you know. Um, yeah. So and they realize that go, public uh, service can be running a restaurant, running a good hotel. Mm hmm. A lot of people just sort of turn inward when they want to figure out what to do and they can't figure out what's next. And they, they really, you know, but what you're Gotta saying get is out there. go out and investigate, go out and see the Talk world. Talk to people, read, go, go to the uh, trade press, their websites, and some do physical magazines still because every industry has got trade publications. Go to the industry association. They often are loaded with data, much of it free information, the size, the growth that you go to the National Restaurant Association and the other NRA, whatever. And those those things and, and Google deep, you know, study the companies before you go to work for a company, read its annual report. That's all free online, online downloadable as PDFs and stuff and see, well, do they have a business philosophy that rings a bell with me? What's their mission statement? Talk. Talk to people who used to work there. Talk to people who left. Some unhappy, some happy. And, and don't ever rely on just one anecdote or two people. But if you talk to enough, you can get a sense that, oh, that's really not a very great place to work. And unless, because every company's got its culture. I'm Intel, you know, one of the great American companies. Well, apparently it was brutal in a lot of ways. Competitive, you had to outperform every year. 
I mean, it was a tough, but the people that fit in there loved it. And the fellows that built it, Grove and the other guys, you know, they're considered some of the greatest technology people in American history. So every, I've even met people didn't like working a Whole Foods market. I met people didn't like working for Southwest Airlines. And those are two companies famous for being, people love working there. So every, every company's different. Um, and every, or, and that goes all the way to the mom and pop, the place on the corner. Uh, you can learn a lot working at a startup, but people today, the students overall, a lot of them underestimate what you can learn from a big company. So I worked for three big companies before I built up Curry Start My Own. I never would have succeeded. That was my graduate school. That was my education. And I have trouble convincing young entrepreneurs, okay, you want to build a restaurant chain. You got this idea. No, go to work for another, just two to three years. Because half what you hear, you'll say, oh, that's stupid. I'll never do that. Half what you hear, you'll say, oh, they understand how to do that. I won't reinvent the wheel. How I did my financial planning, how I did my projections, all that I learned from the big department store company I worked for. But I also learned how not to become removed from the customer like their top management was when they got a private jet and all that. And they, because the only time they really talked to customers was when they were a commercial airline flight, you know? <laughs> and when they went to the private jet, they cut that off. All right, you know, close to that, that might be a little exaggeration, but not much. Um, and, and so find the right big company in your industry. Go to work for Chili's or Applebee's or McDonald's or Chick-fil-A, man, if you want to be in fast food. They are so far ahead of everybody yeah, else in the industry. Love Chick-fil-A. Oh, they, uh, unbelievable company, what they've achieved. And, um, you know, go to work for them for a couple of years. I wouldn't, uh, my era, I went to work for the big department store company, uh, Federated Department Stores in MA. Federated later bought May. Now it's all called Macy's. I wouldn't mm -hmm. recommend that today. They're no longer the best place to learn that they were in the mid 1970s, late 70s. Uh, but man, go to work for Target. Tractor Supply, awesome company. So much to be learned from a company like that. Uh, Five Below, if you want a younger, fast growing company, they're, they're all over. But Target's great, Costco's great, Whole Foods is great. Um, there are so many, if you, even if you want to be an entrepreneur and start your own. Yeah, but most of the young people don't have the patience for that. They want to go the Michael Dell route, you know, drop out of college and and get rich. But but I but I hey, I work with people no matter what path, because no two people have the same path. And uh, you just got to find your own and work it out. But no, the more you know, the more you study, the more you read, read books about the industry. Uh, email me. I'll recommend books to read about most industries, certainly on the histories. Uh, just hit contact on the on the website. Um, and I, and I will, any, any of your listeners that wants, you know, talk to me about anything and they can just email me. I'm, I'm always glad to uh, communicate with uh, anybody. That's lovely. Yeah. We'll, we'll definitely add your email to the, the show notes great, for people great. to, to take you up on that. So yeah, just generalizing from that, be data driven and go out and get some experience in the world. Um, last question. Mm -hmm. So what do you think are some of the key principles for success in business? And I guess this is a two-part question. Do you think, do those principles apply in nonprofits? There's only one principle in business and that's serve your customer. Give them something the other guys don't give them, make it better every year, totally dedicate your organization to that. Everything else flows from that. If you do that, you can afford to take good care of your employees and you should treat them with respect anyway. You can afford to make your suppliers wealthier and you won't have to worry about your stockholders. They'll do great. And yes, it all applies to nonprofits. And one thing I always say is it's very difficult for nonprofits to serve the public. And I've said that in front of audiences of nonprofit fundraisers and leaders. And the thing is, they're so caught up in raising money in the donor mm -hmm. thing. They get caught up in you know winning awards and looking good to their peers, which is also a big issue in academia, writing just for their peers and not for the public to understand what your your great ideas you scholars are coming up with um and those nonprofits really understand their mission and understand who they are serving and how it's just like a retail store or anything else and really focusing on that and i've seen all sorts of nonprofits in different range of how well they did that and everything but like the museum industry you know you go to their big trade show the first booth you run into was a fundraising consulting firm, charge you a lot of money to show you how to raise more money. And 
their exhibit was said something like how to recognize a donor when they come in the door. So you got all these people coming now it's 20, 40 bucks a ticket for some of these wonderful museums. They're all coming in. Well, where's the good one? Where's the one with, you know, a fat wallet, deep pockets. It's nonsense. I'm, so I, I, I was, shouldn't pick on the people. Really got a wonderful behind the scenes tour of a big art museum in a city that has a big art festival. And I was with a group of people who had actually paid money to get this behind the scenes look. So there's like 15 of us and the ex executive director of this beautiful art museum is showing us around. And as we went to each work of art, the artist was there with it because these were recent works of art or several of them. And they would tell us the whole story of, well, this is how I got into art. And this is why I did this one. And here's what it means. Wonderful, we went floor to floor. One of 15 of us, 20 of us in this group. Everywhere we went, the general public the people that buy tickets <laughs> were standing back. You could tell, well, we're a special group. You know, oh, they're listening to this guy talk. So, well, but they would all be listening in. They were all dying to hear, get that same experience. Some would have the courage to follow the group around and keep listening. Never once did the executive director of the museum ever turn to them and say anything to them. Never once did anybody, you know, I went back there and try, kind of hung out with them a little bit, watch their reactions. Nobody's paying attention to the, the public. You with me? And, and, and it was a very bad experience for them to feel second class all the way around. If the museum had figured out a way to give the same experience we were getting to all of them, which you could figure that out if you worked at it, they would have doubled their donations to the museum. They would have doubled their frequency attendance. They would have I always told the people in the bookstores, man, your goal is not to ring out a lot. You know, how many books can we sell today? Your goal is to make sure when they walk out of this place, they have a smile on their face, they have a desire to return and a desire to tell their friends about it. And if we achieve those things, because they're going to come in, may not spend. They may come in several times and not spend, but sooner or later, they will spend. If we have the right books and the right prices and all that jazz, which we did, and you know our, you know, our average bookstore did almost 10 times what the competition did, change the industry. Um, Oh, make, make great products, make them better every day. And, and uh, man, doing deal, the more time you spend with investment bankers and with lawyers and accountants, the less successful you're going to be. And most great entrepreneurs don't want to be in all those meetings any more than they have to. You do what you have to. I raised millions. I dealt with venture capitalists, all types of investors, some nice, some not. But the thing is, you do what you have to. But I was when I had a really bad, depressing day at Bookstop, I got my mood back in shape by going to a store and waiting on a customer and, and reminding me, this is why I'm in this. I want to bring more books to more people for lower prices and more publishers, more authors have more access. And we took the average bookstore, carried like 10,000 titles. We carried like 70,000 or whatever. I mean, we really, um, and Borders built a chain. They were an older store. They had one store, but I think we had like 12 stores by the time they opened their second one. And then Barnes & Noble bought us and Walden Books bought Borders and the industry evolved. But um, no, uh, uh, Peter Drucker, who's hard to beat, still the greatest management thinker who, among those who didn't run a company. And, uh, you know, he said the purpose of a business is to create a customer. And, uh, and that's his way of phrasing it. But, but he had so much wisdom and um, and, and you got to do a lot of things right. You know, you're as strong as the weakest link. I mean, if you really abuse your employees, you're not going to last. And if you screw your suppliers, you're not going to last. And if you try to cheat your shareholders by creating funny stock shares or, you know, uh, diluting them out of their ownership, you're not going to last. So there, there are a lot of places you can go wrong. But man, if you don't have a good product, you're dead no matter what. And if you have a great product, then you more likely survive <laughs> your other errors. Uh, well, you're such and a be differentiated. Of... Be different. Yeah. Be di you gotta. I see too many business plans that are basically a clone of an existing business, and they think it's different because oh, our website's going to be a little mm. faster, or it's going to be orange instead of blue. And no, no, that's that's not differentiation in the customer's mind. And all it's... those things apply to nonprofit. The, the more they focused, and it can be very difficult. Like at a university, who is the customer? The mm -hmm. faculty senate, 
the donors in a private university, the state government in a state university, the students, the students' parents. Same with hospitals. Is it the doctors that are really you know, in charge? Is it the financial people, hospital administrators? Is it the donors, if it's a nonprofit hospital, or the corporation, stockholders, if it's a for-profit hospital? Uh, is it the nurses? <laughs> oh, and then there's these people called patients. And I know I've spoken at hospital conferences where it was pretty clear patients were never number one in most big hospitals. Most of the doctors and the administrators never know what it's been like to be a patient, to check in and get all the uh, presidents of banks. They've never had their credit card torn up, you know, at a store. They've never driven through the drive through window to deposit a check or anything because theirs is all, you know, auto deposit. The most bank presidents, my, one of my favorite stories. So I got back from a trip. I collect books all over the world. Get back from a trip with two heavy suitcases full of books and dragging them through the airport. And I want to get cash to pay the parking ticket to get out of the airport. And I go to an ATM and it's late at night. Airport's quiet, Austin Airport. And, the, and it looks like it's working. Lights on and I drag my butt all the way over there with all these heavy bags. It isn't working. And once I get there, I say, oh, that's uh, that kind of upset me. And then I think I may have asked the guard or whatever, but is there another ATM? Oh yeah, way over there. And I could see the light on it was blinking like it's working. So I drag my butt all the way down there. I go down, it's out of money too, or not working. And I, I have virtually no temper. I have a temper about every seven years or something. But I, I, it's like, oh, no, this is enough. And, but also I want to do a favor for my fellow travelers. I don't want anybody driving, dragging their butt all the way across this airport only to find this machine is out of order. So uh, I'm surprised it didn't have some sort of security lock on it, but uh, sucker, I unplugged the ATM from the wall. And I'm doing a public service, right? So it won't be flashing its light anymore. And it goes dark. I go home. I come back to the airport, I don't know, three weeks later to fly out on another trip. And I'm thinking, oh, shit, I, I unplugged that ATM. I better go look at that. I went and looked, it was still unplugged. It was still unplugged. Do you know how many vice presidents of either Bank of America or Wells Fargo or whichever one of them operated it? How many vice presidents had walked through that airport in that time period? Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Nobody knows. Nobody's in touch. Whereas if I had gone like to the Taco Bell restaurant and screwed around with the letters on their sign or something, I can assure you, Taco Bell managed to be, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, quick, quick, fix it, you know, because they care about their business. And yet, and then I, of course, I, Spend enough of my life where I'm sitting around with the investment types and the rich types, and they make fun of the Taco Bells, and I just kind of roll my eyes. Oh man, God wishes the Taco Bell people were running this bank, but I guess I better not tell you that. You know, <laughs> no, no, you, you got to love your business. You got to care about the customer. You got to care about every detail. Hyatt put chocolates on the pillows and revolutionize the hotel business. Movie theaters put in drink cup holders in the seats. Revolution, you know. Um, you just got you got to be able to put yourself in the shoes of others, and that is seems to be so hard for so many people, and in our current political environment, harder than ever. But you have to. When I'm running a bookstore, man, we had atheists, we had Marxists, we had far right wingers. I'm sure we had some Nazis, uh, probably uh, working as bookstore clerks but certainly as customers, they're all God's children. And I love it. I love it because you, you, you find out what's going on in the real world. And um, yeah, <laughs> <You know? laughs> what can I say? All you have to do is turn on the TV news to see people that are just completely out of touch. Well, I love your, your customer focus. I love your enthusiasm and just your general love for business. I definitely encourage everyone to check out American History, uh, American Business History Center dot org. Yeah, right? American Business History dot org. Yes, American, American Business History dot org. Got it, and we'll have the link in the show notes, of course. Gary, thank you so much, and uh, thanks everyone for tuning into Philosophy for Flourishing. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much, John. It's been great.